Me too. Okay, Peanut, did you have fun? Boy, you are a ball of energy. I know another Peanut, he plays bass in 311. You have almost as much energy as he does. All right, and this is Dexter over here, who also is a high energy dog. So uh, the very, this is the roadmap to success. The very first thing we talked about was exercise. Um, these guys run around a lot, but running around with each other isn't gonna help them develop any self-control. As a matter of fact, it's actually probably gonna go the opposite direction. I'll t I'm gonna leave all the treats here for you. I, to I already told you I'm gonna hook you up on that. He's telling me secrets. Um, so I'd like to see the guardian walking the dogs at least once every other day. The walk doesn't have to be a huge exercise walk because both of these guys like to play fetch. And I find fetch is a much more efficient way of exercising a dog. As you can see, they just have a lot of pent up energy. And so uh, the fetch is awesome because they're in pursuit mode and it really helps them burn their energy a lot more efficiently than walking. Now for walking, if we do get them doggy backpacks, if you get a doggy backpack, don't get a cheap one. Make sure you get a, don't get a super expensive one, but a cheap one will fall apart. But now you can put some like bottles of water in it or weight in it and that helps them make their walk more efficient because now the dog is carrying weight and is also doing a job which will help it focus a little bit more. Um, now, um, what I would like the guardian to do is start a journal about fetching them. And so uh, I find that there's a certain quantity of fetching that can deliver good behavior. Dog's energy is gonna come out one way or the other. You can decide where it's expended or the dog can decide and usually they decide in ways that we don't want. So basically I would uh, take the dogs outside one at a time and fetch, count the number of fetches and then come back in and, and start off. My first starting point is I would take them out and fetch until the dog stops bringing the ball. That's kind of your maximum number of fetches. Then the next time I would do it, maybe make, uh, do that early in the morning. Remember, make sure you don't exercise your dog with a full stomach. They have a descended stomach and they can actually uh, get it tangled up and it can burst and pressurize. Uh, pressurize, then burst. So we don't want to do that. Um, so uh, I would take them out, do their business in the morning, and then take them one at a time to uh, fetch. And then count the number of fetches and then write it down on your list. And then bring that dog inside, bring the other dog out, and then fetch with the other dog. You're in a, and then at the end of the day, count up, or grade the day. Give it a one through, uh, an A through an F record, uh, or final grade. And then the next day, marry it up. I'm guessing you're probably gonna have to get a combination of maybe like 40 fetches for him in the morning, 25 midday, and 25 uh, early afternoon, or early evening. Uh, but keep on playing around and vary it up, and then grade the day, and then when you get a day that has the response that you're looking for, then that's the amount of exercise you need to start getting them on a regular basis. Taking care of their surplus energy is not gonna fix your problems, but it's gonna make all the rest of the things we're gonna talk about now much easier and easier to fix those problems. Yes, I know, buddy, we're almost done. Um, all right, um, so multiple fetches a day. And then, um, uh, let me see, uh, I already covered the dog backpack. The other thing we went over were, uh, these dogs really don't have any respect for their guardian because there really aren't any rules and they get petted on demand. And then, as we saw in the video above, they compete with each other for attention. And so they're break competing by breaking the rules to get more attention, and this is just escalating in the wrong direction. So we went over a number of rules to help the dog start to see and identify the humans. Yes, I'm telling you, I'm gonna tell her to get you a dog bed in a second. Um, but the, uh, the, the lack of rules can give the dog the impression we're peers, and then being able to tell the human when to pet me by jumping up on us, after a while can give the dog the impression that I am responsible for the humans, but then the human doesn't listen for, to me. So that means I have to bark at everything outside the window that I see, because I'm a rat terrier, uh, because I think that it's my job to protect my human because my human won't look out for themselves. So I have to warn things and ward things off before my human can be taken advantage of. And that creates stress. I think that, uh, that Peanut is pretty stressed out. So uh, the more rules and structure we provide, we can shrink her world and help her be more relaxed and go off duty. You can't kiss me, Peanut. I'm dating someone right now. Uh, so let me see, uh, some of the rules we, we went over, we're breaking one right now, but we need to have a dog in the, in the picture. So no furniture for at least 30 days or as long as these problems are still going on. The dog gets up in the furniture without permission, we're gonna say off once. The dog gets off and we're gonna reach over immediately and pet it and say the word off within that three second window so we can create a positive association. Remember, anything your dog is doing with you within, uh, when you pet it is what you're reinforcing. The guardian was petting these dogs when they were jumping up on her. And so every time that happened, they were training, she was training them, this is the proper way to ask me for attention. So uh, petting with a purpose we'll get in a minute will actually help with that. So first thing is uh, not being allowed in the furniture without, for 30 days or as long as the problem's going on, unless, uh, and then after that point, only with an invitation. And when the dog uh, gets an invitation, it's only for good behavior. So if I invite Peanut up here and then she starts barking, then she has to get down. 
or if I invite Peanut up and she gets down to get a drink of water, she'd need an invitation to get back up here. Um, let me see. Yes, you're being a pill, uh, Dexter. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see. What else? Uh, other rules. Uh, when humans are eating, not being allowed to be within seven feet of the humans who are eating. Um, having to sit before we go out a door. And remember, we're only going to ask once. Sit. The dog doesn't sit. Dexter, stop. I know this is not a lot of fun, but we got to finish this, buddy. This is going to help you have a much more relaxed life, I promise. Um, so uh, the dog, we're going to go to the door, door and say sit. If the dogs don't sit, we walk away for one minute. Next time we walk away for two minutes, then for four minutes, then for eight minutes. And as soon as one of the dogs sits, then we open the door and let that dog out. So if she sits right away, then she gets to go out and Dexter doesn't sit. We keep on walking away and double the length of time. We'd only say it once. The more you repeat a command to a dog, the less you mean it. So say it once, and if the dog doesn't give you do what we want, we're asking it to do the smallest thing it possibly can do, sit. And as soon as it sits, that door opens. After a while, the dogs will go start sitting at the door as their way of communicating they want to go outside. Uh, let me see, other rules. Um, let me see. Um, uh, not also not being allowed in the kitchen when the humans are, are preparing food. I just got done, we just also went through a structured feeding ritual, which the guardian really needs to practice. His word is chow, her word is grub. And so we're gonna assign that using passive training. So every time he takes his first bite of food, we're gonna say ch uh, chow for Dexter. And after about a month or two, we say chow, he'll know that means I get to go eat because when she hears the word, there's no food in her mouth. When he hears it, he's got a uh, some food in his mouth. So remember, every time you're giving a treat, the dog should hear the uh, command word after you place the treat in their mouth. The guardian was kind of sometimes saying the word before she placed the treat or simultaneously. Simultaneously is okay. I like doing it before. Before I have to hold your paws here because you're gonna knock off my tablet, buddy. And he likes to paw up like crazy. And again, lack of rules and structure. And he's really a Velcro dog. He feels like he needs to be with the guardian all the time, which is why one of the rules needs to be, uh, uh, they, he, both dogs need to respect a one foot boundary of personal space. So if the dogs violate that, we're going to use the escalating consequences. When we know the dog's going to come over and violate our space, we're going to hiss before they get there. Both dogs responded really well to the hiss. Second thing we do is to stand up abruptly, turn to face the dog, and keep your belly button pointing at the dog, no matter where the dog goes, unless it leaves the room or stops. When it stops, it can stand, sit, or lie down. If it does any of those three things, it says, we're, I'm going to stop challenging you. We communicate, we appreciate that by taking two steps backward. Left foot, right foot only, stop, wait one second, then take a step back and then go back to doing what you're doing. Anytime you're uh, communicating with the dog through the escalating consequences using movement, you want to take a pause between each step away. Uh, that kind of punctuates your movement. So that's the second consequence of standing up abruptly, turning to face the dog and keep facing them until they're stationary. Then we take two steps back, pause one second, and go back to what we're doing. The third escalating consequence is to march directly at the dog until it turns sideways or greater. When I say march, I don't mean stomping. And I don't mean stopping when you get to where the dog is. If the dog is still there, when you get there, you walk through the dog. The dog needs to learn to defer. That's something we talked about off camera, but the guardian needs to walk through the dogs. The dog's job, leaders don't defer to followers. So I want, if you're walking to the kitchen and the dog's standing in your way, walk through it. If it's sitting or laying down, you can walk around it. That's being a kindness. Uh, but if the dog's in your way, it needs to learn. My job is to defer and get out of the house, out of the way, especially because we have special needs people in the house. The dogs need to learn, no matter if any human's coming, my job is to move out of their way. That's going to help uh, create a good choreography and also help if we do have other special needs that come and visit us, that the dogs are going to be more, uh, we're helping them have the, teach them the behavior we want them to have. Uh, let me see. Um, the exercises we went over, I'm gonna, I should be linking these above. If I forget to do it, please message me and I'll link them in. But there should be a link above to a focus exercise that I did with a different client. I'd like the guardian to practice that with each dog twice a day. And the focus exercise is really simple. You have about 10 to 15 treats and, each, uh, and keep the movements the same. So one second, the raising of the treat is always going to be one second no matter where you're at. But then eventually when the dog's staring at you pretty consistently, then we raise up one second and then one second to deliver. Then eventually one second, two seconds to deliver. Eventually one second and 20 seconds to deliver. And make sure you're holding that treat between you and the dog's vision. So the dog is looking at you in the face the whole time. This is a way to redirect the dog's attention later on in life. Um, but if we practice and very progressively, very gradual, eventually we get to the point where they can stay, you say focus, and they just stare at you for 20 seconds. Dogs can't multitask. So if you get the dog to look at you, it's not gonna be looking at the mailman or who's outside the door or the boogeyman or whatever and barking it's gonna be paying attention to you. It's a very powerful way to redirect the dog's attention. Uh, let me see, uh, the other thing we went over is the stay, because both these dogs need some self-control. And so uh, the stay, remember we wanted to practice for three Ds, first for duration, then for distance, then for distractions. 
and I, there's a video above this. Uh, come on, buddy, you're killing me. Uh, that's going to actually uh, uh, go through the uh, teaching your dog to stay. Um, if you have questions on these techniques, let me know. The stay, um, and when you're training your dog, you really want to keep it to less than 90 seconds per practice round. The stay is going to be different because we're going to work up to five minutes of stay for duration before we ever start moving away from the dog for distance. And so that's one of those rare exceptions. But if you start getting frustrated when you're training the dog with any of these exercises, always end on a good note. And if your dog starts to get flustered or frustrated, or you do, make sure you end next time you have a good one. And we want the dog to have a fond remembrance of it. Now, if your dog does get frustrated or you got frustrated towards the end of it, we get done. Get down on the floor, play a little ball, give the dog a little massage. We want to make sure that the dog has a fond remembrance of that activity. Hey, I did, you know, at the end it got a little bit rough, but then she gave me a little mini massage. I loved it. So the next time he wants to, or she wants to do that again. Um, so uh, two times a day for each dog for this stay as well. And gradually work yourself up to the five minutes. You'd like to get you up to the five minute mark no later than two weeks from the date this session started. So I really want you, and this, these things work better. They're both very easy and they're very simple, but you should practice them throughout the day. Ideally, having your dog nap or sleep between practice sessions, dogs categorize and file away what they learned while they sleep. So if you need your dog to take a nap in between each time, don't tell them nap, just wait for them to nap and then try to do it again. But the idea is just to sprinkle this in. Now, two times a day is the minimum for both of these exercises. Your dogs will learn faster if you go more than that. But I'd like to see a bare minimum of twice a day so we can really carry some momentum over and help the dog to progress. But if you can do it five times a day with each dog, you're going to make a lot faster progress, which is more invigorating for the humans as well. Uh, let me see. Um, let me see. Uh, we also went over petting with a purpose and passive training. The guardian uh, has already done a session with me, so she kind of remembered both of those from before. Passive training, I don't think I went over before, so that's just recognizing any time the dog does something we want. So remember, when we pet a dog, we want to pet under the chin whenever possible because that facilitates that nose-up orientation that she just, Peanut just showed, and that's what proud dogs do is have their nose in the air. Insecure dogs look down. So if we pat a dog on top of the head, that they have a tendency to get down. I know you'll get down here in a second. You should be enjoying being on the furniture because you're not going to be allowed up here for long, very much longer for a while. Um, and then eventually when the dogs are well behaved, we can let them back on the furniture when they were the guardian wants to, but the guardian should make the decision. Uh, but for passive training, it's just recognizing every time the dog comes to you, pet it and say come. Don't say good come. Don't say the dog's name. Just say come. Next to, every time the dog lays down next to you, pet it and say down or crash or whatever the word is. Every time they walk in their kennel, say the word kennel. Every time they lay down uh, or you know, eat their food, we're going to say chow or grub. Um, so that way, and also for the stay, each dog should have its own unique command word. I would say break and release. So give, uh, I think we said break for him and release for her because they're closer to the, the letters are closer to their name. But basically, uh, that way we can put both dogs into a stay and then release just Peanut if I want to by using a unique release word for her. And because he is a Velcro dog, I would like the guardian, once, she, once he's in, got the stay down, to utilize that. Help him practice being alone. So put him in a stay, then go to the bathroom so you don't have an audience. Uh, put him a stay, go and make yourself some macaroni and cheese or something. Come on, buddy. Um, so that he practices self-control as well as not necessarily feeling incomplete unless I'm next to my humans 24-7. Uh, and petting with a purpose is simply not petting the dog when they jump up. Instead, asking them to sit or uh, lay down or do some, something to change their state of mind. Now, if after a while, the dogs are going to come and start sitting in front of the humans as a way of saying, I'm sitting to prepay for attention. When that happens, that's awesome. So appreciate it when it happens, but make sure we do pet him and say the word sit. Even though it sit is an easy thing, every time the dog sits and we reinforce it, we make it more inclined to do so the next time we give it a command. All right, guys, uh, that's about all I have for your roadmap to success. Peanut, are you going to whine a little bit? Can we get those ears up? Those are pretty ears. No, not for the end of this video? All right. Well, this is Peanut and Dexter's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it. Isn't that right, buddy?